Chapter 25 George fell back through the door and landed on the floor with a heavy thump. This time, the journey back from outer space to Eric's library had seemed to suck all the breath out of him, and he had to lie on the floor for a few seconds, panting, before he could get up. When he staggered to his feet, he hoped he would see Eric hurtling through the doorway behind him, but instead, all he saw was the outline of the door, which had become faint and wavy. It seemed to be fading into nothing. He yelled out, Eric, but got no reply. A millisecond later, the door vanished entirely. Cosmos, shouted George, undoing his glass space helmet. Quick, Cosmos, we have to get... But as he turned around to face the mighty computer, he had his second great shock. Where Cosmos should have been, there was just a spaghetti tangle of colored wires in an empty space. Looking wildly around the room, George saw that the library door was ajar. He ran through it and into the hallway to find the front door wide open and the cold night air blowing in. With no time to take off his spacesuit, he dashed into the street where he could make out the shapes of four boys running along the road. One of them was carrying a bulky backpack with a few wires sticking out of the top of it. George hurried after them as fast as he could in his heavy suit. As he stumbled along, familiar voices drifted back to him on the wind. Be careful with that, George heard Ringo shout. Beep, beep, came a noise from the backpack. Unlawful action, unauthorized command. When it's going, when's it going to shut up? Shouted Tank, who was carrying the backpack. How come it can speak when it isn't even plugged in? Help, help, came the mechanical voice from the backpack. I am being kidnapped. I am the world's most amazing computer. You cannot do this to me. Alarm, alarm. It'll run out of battery soon, said Whippet. Unhand me, you villains, said the voice inside the backpack. This bouncing around is bad for my circuits. I'm not carrying it any farther, said Tank, coming to a sudden halt. George immediately stopped in his tracks. Someone else can take over, he heard Tank say. All right, said Ringo in a menacing voice. Give it to me. Listen up, little computer. You will shut up for the rest of the journey, or I will take you to pieces, bit by bit, until you are just a big pile of microchips. Eek, said the computer. Do you understand? said Ringo in fierce tones. Of course I understand, said the computer snootily. I am Cosmos, the world's most amazing computer. I am programmed to understand concepts so complex that your brain would explode if you were even to, I said, snarled Ringo, opening the top of the backpack and speaking down into it. Shut up. Which part of those two words don't you get, you moron? I am a peaceful computer, replied Cosmos in a small voice. I am not used to threats or violence. Then be quiet, replied Ringo, and we won't threaten you. Where are you taking me? whispered Cosmos. To your new home, said Ringo, shouldering the backpack. Come on, gang, let's get there. The boys set off at a run once more. George staggered after them as fast as he could, but he was unable to keep up. After a few more minutes, he lost them in the foggy, dark night. There was no point in running any farther. He couldn't tell which way they had gone. But even so, he felt sure he knew who had asked Ringo and his friends to break in and steal Cosmos, and knowing that was the first step to finding the supercomputer again. As Ringo and the boys ran off into the night, George turned and walked back to Eric's house, where the front door was still wide open. He went in and headed toward straight for Eric's library. Eric had told him to look for the book, but which book? The library was full of books. They stretched from floor to ceiling on the shelves. George picked out a large, heavy volume and looked at the cover. Euclidean Quantum Gravity, it said on the front. He flicked through the pages. He tried to read it little. Because, because the retarded time coordinate goes to infinity on the event horizon, the surfaces of constant phase of the solution will pile up near the event horizon. It was hopeless. He had no idea what any of it meant. He tried another book, this one called Unified String Theories. He read a line from it. The equation for a conformal, his brain hurt as he tried to make out what it meant. In the end, he decided it meant he hadn't yet found the right book. He carried on looking around the library. Find the book, Eric had said. Find my new book. George stood in the middle of the library and thought very hard. With no Cosmos, no Eric, and no Annie, it seemed terribly empty in that house. The only link George had to them now was a pink spacesuit, some tangled wires, and these huge piles of science books. Suddenly, he missed them all so terribly that he felt a sort of pain in his heart. He realized that if he didn't do something, 
he might never see any of them again. Cosmos had been stolen, Eric was fighting with a black hole, and Annie would certainly never want to speak to him again if she thought George had anything to do with her dad getting lost forever in outer space. He had to think of something. He concentrated very hard. He thought of Eric and tried to imagine him with his new book in his hand, to picture the front cover so that he could remember what the book had been called. Where would he have put it? Suddenly, George knew. He ran into the kitchen and looked next to the teapot. Sure enough, there, covered in tea stains and rings where hot mugs had been rested on top of it, was a brand new book called Black Holes, which, George now realized, was actually written by Eric himself. There was a sticker on it that read, in what must be Annie's handwriting, Freddy the Pig's favorite book, with a little cartoon drawing of Freddy next to the words. That's it, thought George. This must be the new book Eric was so happy to find when Freddy stormed through the house. This must be the one. There was just one more thing he needed from Eric's house. It was another book, a large one with lots and lots of pages. He grabbed it from beside the telephone, stripped off Annie's pink spacesuit, and, shoving the two books into his school bag, rushed back to his own house, closing Eric's front door carefully behind him as he went. That evening, George scarfed down his supper very quickly and then shot upstairs to his room, claiming he had lots of homework to do. First of all, he got the very big book out of his bag. On the front, it said, Telephone Directory. As his parents didn't have a phone, George had thought it was unlikely they would have the phone book, which was why he had borrowed Eric's. He searched through the alphabetical list under R. Using his finger to go down the long column of names, he came to Reaper, Dr. G, 42 Forest Way. George knew Forest Way. It was the road that led out of town, to the woods where his parents took him in autumn to gather mushrooms and blackberries. He figured he couldn't go there tonight. It was too late and his parents would never let him out at this time. And anyway, he still had work to do with the Black Holes book. First thing in the morning, though, he'd go to Dr. Reaper's house on his way to school. By then, he hoped he would have a plan. He put down the phone book and got Eric's Black Holes book out of his bag, desperately hoping it would hold the information he needed to rescue Eric. Every time he thought about Eric, which was about once every three minutes, he felt awful. He imagined him alone and frightened in outer space, not knowing how to get back, with a black hole trying to drag him into its dark belly. George opened the book and read the first sentences of. Page 1. We are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars, he read. It was a quote from the famous Irish writer Oscar Wilde. George felt it was written specially for him. He was indeed in the gutter, and he knew for sure that some people were looking at the stars. So he kept on reading, but that first sentence was the only one he understood. Next he read, In 1916, Carl Schwarzschild found the first ever analytic black hole solution to Einstein's equation. Ugh, he groaned to himself. The book was in a foreign language again. Why had Eric told him to look for this book? He didn't understand it at all, and Eric had written it. Yet every time Eric had told him about science, he had made it sound so simple, so easy to understand. George felt his eyes tearing up. He'd failed them, Cosmos, Annie, and Eric. He lay down on his bed with the book in his hand as hot tears ran down his cheeks. There was a knock at the door and his mom came in. Georgie, she said, you look very pale, honey. Are you feeling ill? No, mom, he said sadly. I'm just finding my homework really difficult. Well, I'm not surprised. His mom had picked up the black holes book, which had fallen out of George's hand and onto the floor. She looked through it. It's a very difficult textbook for professional researchers. Honestly, I'm going to write to the school and tell them this is ridiculous. As she spoke, a few pages fluttered out from the back of the book. Oh dear, said George's mom, collecting them up. I'm dropping your notes. They're not mine. George was about to say when he stopped himself. At the top of one of the pages, George read, My difficult book made simple for Annie and George. Thanks, Mom, he said quickly, grabbing the pages.